The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. We'll formally begin. My formal welcome to you all. Thank you, all of you, for staying awake this long and actually showing up. Um, my name is not Russ Pavlice. It's Pavlicek, but it sort of got cut off the edge of the screen, so it's right over there. There is a K on the end. Um, how many people, were any of you inside my first talk? Yeah, a couple of you. Um, we're gonna be talking about Zen today, the Zen hypervisor and the Zen project. Uh, first, a quick slide of who I am. I have been around for a long time. Uh, uh, first show I ever went to like this was the Atlanta Linux Showcase in 1997. Uh, you know, 500 geeks on a weekend. So, I mean, this is like, you know, old home territory coming to these ones. It's really great. Uh, I've, been, I've had a Linux desktop system at home since 97. And, uh, you know, I had a column for InfraWorld. I had a column for Processor. I used to do a thing called the Linux Show webcast way back in the day. Wrote a book and some other stuff. So uh, I've done a lot of this sort of, sort of stuff over the years. Uh, I got sort of uh, stuck into the closed source abyss for several years, and I've since been liberated, so I'm celebrating. <laughs> Here I am. Zen. Zen has been around for a long time. One of the first bits of news is that, uh, uh, I don't know how many people heard, but about six weeks ago, Zen became part of the Linux Foundation. It is now a, Li a Linux Foundation collaborative pro project and uh, uh, that's really been kind of exciting because uh, uh, there have been a lot of stuff in the last few years about, oh, you're owned by Citrix, you're not really open source or something. Nonsense. The project is alive, the project is well, and we are taking steps to make sure that the project is treated correctly and understood correctly as an open source project. Citrix has some, uh, you know, things like Zen Server, which is a product, uh, for which you can pay money for. Um, I'm actually employed by Citrix as a Zen, Zen project evangelist. I have absolutely no relationship to anything that we sell. Um, I am project, so that's why I'm here. Uh, I talk to people and I try to make sure the community is thriving as best I can. Um, if you go to our website, which for some reason, oh there it is, zenproject.org, and that's org, not just dot or. Um, that's our new website that was uh, unveiled right at the same time that it became part of the uh, uh, Linux Foundation. Uh, please go there, you know, sign up for an account, it's free, we won't spam you, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of interesting stuff there. Um, you can find out about these things there. You know, what are the parts of Zen? We'll be talking about this in more detail here in the next few minutes. There's the hypervisor, there's uh, uh, Zappy, the, uh, the cloud enabling uh, API. There's work on the hypervisor for ARM, and that's both on ARM-based servers and on uh, ARM mobile devices, which is kind of a cool and strange concept. But uh, you know, for people who are younger than I am, you know, if I pull out my little Android phone, this thing back when I went to college, was not more, um, more computing power than the campus had. It is multiple orders of magnitude more computing power than our campus had in my hand. So the notion that we would try to do something with uh, mobile devices you know, may seem strange, but simply because we haven't wrapped our minds around it yet. There's some interesting use cases that are coming uh, and it could be incredibly cool. We'll also talk a little bit about the Mirage OS a little bit later. The governance, for those who are interested in such things, of the uh, Zen project uh, is sort of a mixture between the way the Linux kernels operates and Apache operates. And if you go to zenproject.org, there's a whole thing on governance there. But, uh, you know, it's a consensus-based decision-making uh, situation. 
but this is very definitely an open source project run as that. Uh, this is not subject to product constraints by anybody. So why should I care about Zen? Well, this is the one business slide that's in the entire deck. So if you're allergic to business uh, arguments, you know, just hold your breath for 15 seconds, we'll get through it. It's enterprise-worthy scalability, it's got a solid track record. You know, if Amazon can bet its business on it, so can you. And then just look at some, these are just some of the uh, partners that signed on when it became part of the Linux Foundation. And you look at that list and you realize there's something significant going on here. These people all have a vested stake in Zen, and there's a reason. If you take a look at the way the Zen contributor uh, community is working, in times past there, three years ago, 2010, you see a distribution of you know, over 60% Citrix, about two-thirds of what was going on in Zen was Citrix-based, because Citrix, for those who don't know, bought Zen Source, which was the company behind the Zen project inside the years past, and uh, it made a lot of mistakes. We made a lot of mistakes about the way it was handled, and that's something that's being resolved over the past couple of years. It's part of the reason why I'm here. Uh, I've only been around for, for six months, um, and uh, my, my boss and his boss have only been around for a couple of years. This was a, a determined change of direction to make sure that Zen Project thrived. And we see that from being something that was kind of Citrix heavy, by the time you get to 2012, you know, Citrix piece of it is only about 40, a little over 40%. If you look at a similar uh, graph of, say, KVM, which is about the closest uh, comparable thing, you'll actually find that the 2012 graph looks fairly similar to what you see there between Red Hat and IBM and all the others going to KVM. So this is actually a fairly good distribution as far as participation from various people. And if you look down below on this slide, which you'll be able to do afterwards when it's posted, um, you know, there's a lot of different companies. There's actually a very significant university portion as well. Uh, we have a lot of people in, inside the university systems who are working with Zen. So it's, uh, it's really very good because it's a very wide usership. Um, we've got technology. And you know, the thing about this, I actually just added this slide as I got here because, like I said, I've, only, I've worked with Zen before, but I haven't been deep into Zen except for the past six months, and I'm still sort of spinning up on a lot of this stuff. And it seems like every time I turn around and look at stuff on the wiki, I'm finding stuff that I didn't even know was there. Because you think it's the hypervisor. Well, the hypervisor is the beginning, but there's tons of other stuff. And uh, not only is the hypervisor, you've got the whole business of you know, live migration between VMs. That was, uh, you know, that was a big deal a few years ago for anyone who was doing anything with virtualization. Now it's kind of expected, but it's there as part of Zen. There is the cloud readiness part, which is uh, Zen Cloud Platform and Zappy, the, the API, which uh, powers the cloud platform. Um, you have high availability uh, in, in an extension called Remus. Um, Remus is kind of interesting. It takes a little bit more to configure up front, and maybe that's why people don't talk about it quite as much as some of the other things, but <laughs> what I've found over the years, I've known lots of HA solutions. They all take more to configure up front. So, I mean, this shouldn't spook anyone as far as I'm concerned. But it's there. It's part of it. If you want to use it, go ahead. If you're going to bring things into production. Um, lots of different control domains are supported, and we'll talk about that if you're not, if you don't know what a control domain is. We'll get to that in a second. <coughs> Even wider uh, variety of guest domains, and those are just the virtual machines you want to stand up. And then we've got multiple virtual virtualization modes which are helping performance. And we'll go into that in detail in just a second. So let's just consider just general hypervisor architecture just for a second. This is a picture of what is known as a type one hypervisor, okay? Just sort of textbook. Um, you've got the hardware layer sitting there, you've got your box. On top of the box runs a hypervisor. And in that hypervisor, you've got the scheduler, MMU, you've got all these device drivers that allow you to talk to the hardware. And then you've got your guest VMs sitting on top. Textbook, type one. There's a second type, 
called an OS-hosted type, type 2. And here you see it a little bit differently. You have the hypervisor sort of running in the host OS, sometimes at the kernel level, sometimes not. You've got the guests then having to talk to that host OS. The devices are sort of sitting on top in the user level. So it's a different picture. And people sometimes say, well, who's better, Zen or KVM? The correct answer is neither. They're just different. Zen comes closer, although it's not exact, and we'll get into this in a second, to a type 1. KVM is more type 2-ish, but they have some differences too. So some people have said it's a type 1 and a half. But, you know, uh, I'll leave that to a KVM person to give a, a better explanation. But they are just different models. They have different characteristics, and they have different performance characteristics and different security characteristics. So we're going to just focus a little bit on some of the things that Zen brings to the table. Zen, type 1 with a twist. Okay, you've got the standard type 1 picture. Zen, on the other hand, is a little different. You notice here, we've got the hardware layer, we've got the hypervisor with the scheduler and MMU, we've got the guests, but where are the device drivers? Well, they sit up here in a thing called the control domain, or, or DOM0, domain zero. The control domain for, uh, for Zen is either Linux or BSD. Several flavors of both are available. Um, the idea, and the nice thing about this, is that if we actually had the device drivers in the hypervisor, then every time we needed to support a new device, you need to update the hypervisor, or you have to have some sort of modular system. So suddenly the hypervisor actually gets busy and it takes maintenance. By using this Zen architecture of a control domain, we just have to make sure that this control domain, this Linux or BSD system, actually has the right hardware interfaces, actually has the drivers for your hardware. That's real simple these days. You know, how many times these days do you take a modern version of Linux or BSD, throw it on your machine, and it's not working, you know, as far as talking to devices? That's, that's not, uh, not a big deal. And uh, so having this segmentation like this is helpful. And then on top of it, having this control domain sitting there means that that becomes the way that you can talk to the hypervisor. The job of domain zero is to provide the, the drivers but also to provide you with the interface to the hypervisor. So if you need to do something the way uh, Zen is behaving, you go to DOM0, you go to your control domain and work with it. So just to be clear, the hypervisor is not in the Linux kernel. But everything that's needed for Zen and the Zen guests to operate is in the Linux kernel. You know, this is... Uh, you know, it goes back to the picture I just said, but sometimes people get confused that you need to have Zen in the kernel. No, you don't. You just have to make sure the enablement is there. Starting with uh, the 3.0 kernel, everything that you need by default to run Zen is already inside the mainstream kernel, period. Just add toolkits, you're ready to go. So all, all Linux distros, with the exception of RHEL 6, have what they need to run Zen out of the box. Just install the, the, uh, the toolkits. RHEL 6, Red Hat made a business decision. They decided they wanted to go KVM. And that was their choice, it's their business. Bottom line though is that you just can't make Zen work. That stuff that's supposed to be in the kernel to make it work isn't inside the pre-built uh, RHEL kernels. Um, now, the interesting thing about that is that there are some of the guys in the CentOS community who've actually started a separate project to bring Zen into CentOS 6. And in fact, I was talking with one of the guys last week at Texas Linux Fest. He said they're just, by now, probably about a week or two from announcing a beta for it. So if that's of interest to you to have an upgrade, because there are a lot of people who are running Zen on RHEL 5. And they wanted to upgrade, but they didn't want it to change over to KVM. So this suddenly becomes a possible upgrade path. So if you're interested in that, 
keep your eyes peeled to the CentOS guys. It's an interesting thing. <coughs> to do a Zen install, basically, it's real simple. You install whatever you want for your control domain. You install the Zen packages that go along with that, reboot, and then just do whatever configuration. It's actually pretty simple. Um, and if you need information, if you go down here, it'll be on the slides, the Zen Project Wiki has tons of detailed information about how to do this on a distribution by distribution uh, basis. Okay, basic concepts. As I said, there is this notion of this control domain. So you've got the picture here that you've got the control domain which talks to the hypervisor and you've got your guests over here and it's all sitting on top of Zen. Also, as I said, is the issue of a console. So, you know, it's like you're starting up a VM. Sometimes you want to see what happened during the, the boot up of that VM. You want to interface with a console. Well, that actually gets handled through the control domain. So that becomes your interface point for that as well. You also have a Zen management tool stack. We'll be talking about that a little bit, uh, just a little bit as well. And then finally, you've got, uh, got the option of having what we call stub or driver domains. And we'll get into that more. It has to do with uh, a concept which we call disaggregation. It becomes a possible way, if you need it for performance or for security, that you can basically peel out teeny tiny little VMs that just do one thing. Just handle network I.O just handle some other type of bio, whatever it is. And we'll get to the reason why that's actually very valuable in, in, in just a minute. So not only is there, uh, you know, uh, the hypervisor, but we have the toolkits. And here's some of the tool stacks. We actually have three different tool stacks. And it depends on what you want to do. You can use any one of them. But if you're trying to do just something with just a couple VMs locally on one machine, the default is called XL. Uh, the older version is called XM, but XL is the default now. There is, of course, if you've worked with KVM, Libvirt and Versh. We also can work with that. And then if you want to actually work on sort of a cloud basis, you want to deal with multiple hosts with multiple guests all at the same time, you can use Zappy or through the XE interface. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But it is a question here, your toolkit is a question of how much uh, functional, uh, functionality you want to deal with and how much integration you want to deal with as you go. You pick. It's up to you. And um, you know, if you're doing stuff with, uh, with uh, KVM and stuff like this, you might very well want to deal with, you know, Libvirt and Versh because that's what they use. Um, if you want to deal with things on the cloud basis, you might want to do Zappy, you know. So it's, it's your choice. You can pick whichever one works for you. Um, <clears throat> as far as I know, you really, you're, you're, you're best off if you pick one because uh, I, um, and like I said, I'm still spinning up on a number of things, but as I understand it, if you start going flipping back and forth, you may end up with sort of uh, uh, not seeing the whole world totally. So you're, you're better off just picking a toolkit and working with it. And here we see, you know, the single host basic functions. Libvirt does give you some additional functionality, and we're trying to work with that as well to even beef it up even more, because if you work with uh, Libvirt under KD, uh, KBM, I say KDE. Um, uh, it's a bit richer for them than it is for us. We're trying to, you know, we're trying to upstream patches to them, et cetera. So, so it will be a good experience for everyone. And then, of course, there's Zappy for the whole cloud basis. Now, why are these things important? Well, you know, there are actually multiple products out there in the wild that use different toolkits. Oracle tends to use Excel if you use the Oracle virtualization thing. 
Um, I can never say these, these guys' name correctly, um, but uh, I think it's uh, Japanese, but, okay. But, uh, uh, you know, they use libvirt, and then things like Citrix Zen Server use, uh, use Zappy. And then if you look at the services, you know, Amazon is actually working here in the stack. That's because their interface deals with the cloud stuff, uh, so they don't need that. And then you see there are other service providers that have picked different toolkits. So it's a, just a question of figuring out what you want to work with and going for it. Now, types of virtualization. Um, how many people here can name all of the Zen virtualization modes and tell me what they mean? Show of hands. Excellent. There should be no snoring. Um, I actually just added these slides, too, because, you know, when I first started, I sort of got banged through the virtualization modes, and after a while, you could actually, like, feel the brain cells bleeding because there are several of these that kind of sound kind of the same alike, but they're different, and it's like too much. So I'm just going to spend about three minutes and just sort of try to give you the basic picture of what this is about, why it's important, and even if you forget it all within five minutes, by the time we get down about four or five slides, I think you'll get the point of why it's important and also why you don't need to worry about it a great deal, but just to be aware of it. So let's start with the easy part. PV, para virtualization, that is, that is the thing that Zen pioneered. And it's, it's a very powerful thing. You know, it's the idea that instead of uh, actually dealing with uh, I.O. to hardware drivers and having to interrupt them, we'll just stick basically an API out there in the guest so that you say, well, you talk to the network thing, boop, and it's very quick and it's efficient, it's good. You don't need to have the special virtualization hardware, as, as we were talking about a couple of minutes ago, uh, PV will work on anything that's x86. Thank you. I have heard that used in the opposite Which? Uh, oh. Okay. They talk about that as being the modern way. Well, it is, in fact, the modern way, and, and we'll get to this in a second. You just have to see where the ramp is going. But it's, it, you know, Zen put it together, and quite frankly, the adoption then came from things like VMware and KVM to use para, para virtualization. But we'll see that this, the para virtualization and the next one for hardware virtualization are kind of the extremes. And what we're going to see is that we're kind of bringing it to a rational middle. Um, so the one extreme is para virtualization where everything uh, where, where it's, it's efficient in a lot of ways, but it does require that on the guest OS that there be these APIs. Well, that's okay if you're running Linux, and it's okay if you're running a BSD, or if, what if you're running Windows? You know, you're not going to tweak Windows too readily. So, uh, so the second uh, mode was the hardware virtualization, and that relies on the the processor extensions that were added, I guess, probably about 10 years ago now, uh, that, um, that both AMD and Intel have. They're different, depending on which architecture it is. But both have virtualization extensions. And if you have that in your hardware, and chances are, if you bought a server in the last 10 years, it has it, um, you can, you, we can leverage those calls. Because of that, we don't need to actually modify the guest at all. So you could stick Windows on there with, with the hardware virtualization, it will run. So it's, uh, that's real good for that, but you gotta make sure you have the right type of hardware. That's, that's key. And then there's another term, full virtualization, which is kind of another way of saying HVM, uh, but it, you see that a lot in the literature and stuff like this, so I just wanted to call that out right here. So you've got, You've got these, these two poles, para virtualization, hardware virtualization. Now from there, you, we began to realize in the history of Zen, they're both interesting, but neither one is optimal. So additional work was, was done. And you've got this PV on HVM drivers. So basically, 
This was one way of trying to use, um, trying to have uh, PV disk and I.O. drivers, power virtualized disk and I.O. drivers within a hardware virtualization uh, uh, scenario. This looks confusing. It is sort of, we'll get to a picture in about three slides. <laughs> That'll help straighten this out. But it, this, the net result was that this is, is kind of hardware virtualization, but with a better performance. And then there's this new one, which is coming in 4.4. We had hoped it would be coming in 4.3, which is coming out later this month. But it's not quite baked yet. PV and HVM container. And that's almost power virtualized, but it can use the hardware to eliminate the emulation of, a, of an MMU. So it is a sort of uh, more of a hopped up version of para, para virtualization. Uh, but it, it does, ha does require uh, the newer hardware. But if you have it, it gives you the best of para virtualization with that extra hardware kick. So here's some pictures uh, for, for those of us who are a little more pictorial. This is what para virtualization kind of looks like. You've got a guest VM. And it's talking over this little API to the control domain so it can reach the drivers, and the drivers go down and talk to the hardware. Kind of basic, uh, uh, basic setup. Um, one of the things here it met calls out is that it is, there are limitations to this in terms of what hardware can be power virtualized, because if you've got a strange device, well, there's not going to be an API for that. You know, if you're just doing network, if you're doing, you know, basic things, we got that covered. So there's some limits to that. Advantage is it is fast and it works on any type of hardware. Then you've got PV with driver domains. And then this is, this is showing if you uh, just get into this disaggregation I talked about before, which we'll get into even a little bit more. But you notice now that the driver domain the guests now speak to the driver domain, which goes down to the hardware. And we can have multiple driver domains. So, I mean, you could have a driver domain that just does network. You have a driver domain that, that just does, you know, something else. And why is that important? Well, security and, and uh, general isolation. If you have a driver that can be hacked, you know, um, there's only so far you can go with it because it's all, it's a driver in a box. And if that box falls over, you can restart the box. Because to restart a driver domain, I think they timed it at uh, something like about three tenths of a second, something like this, like 270 milliseconds, I think is a restart of a driver domain. So I mean, if you have something, you're under attack frequently or something like this, you could recycle, say, your network driver domain every minute if you wanted to. Just reboot it. You know, if, if, it's, uh, if you're worried that it might be compromised or something. But it's segmented off. So you've got that security and isolation. You do have the issue of performance. Because you could do a few of these if you needed to. So you wouldn't have a bottleneck that everything's going through the one network driver. You could have 100 VMs, and 20 of them can be going to one network driver, 20 of them could to another, and so forth, if you wanted to do that. Um, it becomes your choice. So, I mean, you can actually up your performance considerably through the use of this. So this is sort of the augmented PV situation. Now, here's what a hardware virtualization looks like. It's a little different. We see that it actually, for the device, it's got to go down to the hypervisor. The hypervisor then sees the hardware instruction, and it, bring, and it has to translate it, bring it back up into the guest domain. Um, it is, on many IOs, slower than PV. But, because it's hardware virtualization, you don't need to change the, the, uh, the guest software at all. So, um, it doesn't need any sp specific kernel support. It's, it's a reasonable way to do it. Now, we add stub domains to that, for disaggregation, and we see that it's using the same basic model to do the I.O. And it, once again, provides the same sort of benefits for security and robustness and, and isolation. 
Now this one, this is, this is the one that, it's kind of the eye chart. Because if you've just got all these things like you probably just did, you're seeing all these letters here and all this over here and it's like, oh my God, brain cells are bleeding, what the hell does all this mean? I can't remember all of these definitions fast enough. Don't worry about it. Because uh, in a second we'll color it and it'll become kind of uh, obvious. All of these are sort of forms of hardware virtualization, HVM. These bottom couple are PVs, they're power virtualization. You notice that there's some differences here. Let's take a look at that in color. Now, green areas, fully optimal performance. The yellow areas, and that is supposed to be yellow, it just kind of looks kind of brown, but uh, it's okay, but it's not great performance. And then the red areas suck, but they're there. So suddenly now, when you look at the virtualization modes, you begin to see that there's sort of this gradient that's working out here. What's the one that has all green? That's the one that's coming inside the next release. So it's a way of trying to optimize. We started with the hardware virtualization, and we see, see the faults there, where you've got you know, one red and two yellows. It works, but it's not great. And then the fully uh, power virtualized, you still have this yellow box sitting there. So what happens? Let's, uh, let's take a look at this blue box, if you can see it around here. In the future, we fully expect that these two modes, which were not the starting modes, these two will probably be the two main choices. So I mean, it's kind of a long path to get here, but, but that's it. We started with this one, which had problems. We started with this one that had problems, and we are ending up with these two, which are pretty darn good. So if you, uh, you know, once uh, PVH is fully, uh, fully vetted and everything's looking good, probably in the next couple of years, that'll probably become the default if you want to do power virtualization. And, and this one here will probably become the default for uh, hardware virtualization because they'll have the optimal performance. And you're looking at this thing and you're thinking, my God, I just want to start up a machine. I, I don't want to know any of this stuff. A little balloon here, just to be aware that when you, when you start up Zen, you don't need to know this. Because Zen will actually pick the best choice and start you up. Where, you, where this becomes useful is you start running a workload, you say, you know what? Performance could be a bit better. Then all you need to do is shut down the VM, flip the bit in the config file that, that changes the mode, start it back up again. You can run a benchmark, bang, 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 see which mode works best for you. Simple as that. So even though this you know, whole thing that we've been through may seem like an eye chart and brain bleed and all sorts of stuff like this, it's useful down the road if you want to tune. If you don't want to tune, just let it rip. You know, you'll be okay. But if you need to tune, it's there. And that's the power of what we do. You know, in a closed source virtualization situation, chances are they'd make the decision for you. But this is all we're going to support. Bang. One of the beauties of open source is that it's there for you to use and you make the decision. We'll try to give you the best thing we can by default. But if you want something better, go in and just flip the setting and see what happens. So, and as you can see, you know, interrupts and all these things, I mean, your workloads, there's varieties to your workloads. I mean, a, a database machine does not have the same workload as a, a web server. It doesn't have the same workload as like a JBoss server or something like this. So it allows you to do some tuning at this level to see which makes the greatest amount of sense for you. Now let's look a little bit about uh, Zappy and Zen Cloud Platform. What is it? As we said here, it's the tool stack that enables cloudish features out of the box. Allows you to deal with multiple hosts and additional functionality all at the same time. So it gets past just working with one machine. What do you get? Here's the full list. You know, it's not even the full list, but it's a good list. Got all this about live snapshots, checkpointing, migration, 
You've got the ability to migrate VMs between different hosts or different pools of hosts. Uh, all sorts of resource pools and event tracking and you know, just gobs of real good stuff that allow you to do cloudish things. And one of the neat things about this is that if you actually go back and on, on the website, if you take a look, we have some of the early design documents, the concept documents from the late 90s before Zen was actually Zen. The guys who put this together had in their mind this sort of computing someday that we now call cloud. It wasn't called cloud back then. No one knew what cloud was back then. But Zen was designed to be able to do this. So the fact that it's working this way out of the box is not a shock. It was a design goal back before anyone knew what cloud was. And down here, once again, there's all sorts of uh, links. If you, if you go to uh, wiki.zenproject.org, gobs of technical information, just gobs. So, I mean, dig into your heart's delight as far as that, that goes. Zappy comes in two, two variants. One is sort of like Zappy in a box. You get the ISO, stick it into a machine, install, boom, there you go. Now, if you notice, CentOS 5.3, Zen 4.1.3, we're just about to have the release of Zen 4.3. CentOS is, of course, up on 6-something. Um, you know, it's a, it's a little old, but then again, it's a toaster. You're plugging it in, bam, there's your, there's your setup. And once again, you know, keep in mind that this is the, uh, this is the, the uh, Control OS, what does Control OS do? It doesn't do any workload, it controls the hypervisor. It controls, it provides the uh, uh, device drivers and stuff like this. So if it's a little old, not the end of the universe because it's not, it's not working with your you know, SAP system or whatever it is that you want to run. That isn't what this is for. But that gives you the control stuff. But it's, it's strong, it's easy. The other possibility is to just install the Zen Cloud Platform and Zappy packages. And they're available, you know, as it says here, Debian, Ubuntu, there are other ones coming. Uh, you know, you, you just go to uh, your repository and say, you know, apt-get or yum or whatever you're using and go. So there, there's a lot of possibilities there, but you do it either way, whichever makes sense to you. Orchestration, you know, the one bugaboo that some people say is, you know, Zen, it isn't really pretty. Well, you know, what's Zen designed for? Zen is designed for industrial strength virtualization. It's designed for data centers. It's designed for, you know, if you have one VM that you want because, you know, your boss wants you to run Windows because there's a piece of software on that Windows machine that you need to do your job and you just want a little des alternate desktop, VirtualBox is great. Go for it, slam the thing in, run, do whatever you're gonna do, shut it down when you're done. If you want a whole group of machines and you want to be able to administer them without losing your mind, Zen's good. A thousand virtual boxes, major headaches. A thousand Zen machines, not a big deal. And that's because Zen first works from the command line. Why? Because system administrators like to work from the command line. If you use things like Puppet and some of these other uh, Chef and these things that allow you to do all sorts of broad thinking, they work from the command line, stuff like this. So we give you that first. The visuals kind of come afterwards. Now, there are certain ways you can deal with it. There's you know, Cl Apache CloudStack. A couple of those guys were here at this conference speaking at other, other uh, uh, things. Open Nebula. It's another one, OpenStack. Everyone knows OpenStack. Zen works fine with OpenStack. So you can go that way. Another independent effort is called Zen Orchestra. Zen Orchestra is a separate project. It's not actually part of the Zen project, but you know, we help them when we can. They decide they want to kind of throw a GUI over, over the Zen stuff. It's like, more power to you. So they've just been working frantically, from what I understand, and in the last year or so, actually I think, I think it's been less than a year since they uh, started really hammering. There was an old Zen orchestra that kind of petered out and then some new guys got in there and started doing some really neat stuff. Zen orchestra seems to be moving along really interesting. 
if you really want a nice little GUI and you don't want to go the other with one of the cloud stacks or OpenStack or something, take a look at them. Maybe lend a hand. You know, uh, that's that's going to be real interesting to see what happens there. Now, what are the challenges for open source hypervisors? Uh, you can't see the uh, link on the bottom. It'll be on the slides, but uh, there was a major. Uh, uh, major study done by Colt Research, security and reliability, quality of service, among the top three blockers for cloud adoption. If you've worked with cloud at all, you've probably heard this since the beginning. You know, it's like, how, how's it going to be secure? Is it going to be re uh, reliable, et cetera? So that's, that's not great news or uh, new news. We did our own study with the XCP users, actually got several thousand XCP users to respond, which absolutely floored our community manager. He was, ho he was hoping to get, you know, like a couple hundred, and I, th I think we got something like 4,000 responses or something like this. It was just wild. And lo and behold, what did, the, what did they say are the, the biggest issues? Robustness, performance, scalability, security. These are the ones, you know, if you read the trade rags, have been yacked about since the beginning of cloud. So we understand that there's, you know, the issue there. But the thing is that Zen, in its design, helps with just those issues. Now, I mentioned disaggregation. And disaggregation, as I said, is being able to take some of those individual pieces that normally re uh, reside in the control domain, those drivers, split them out in their own little incumbency domains into what are sometimes called stub, stub domains. If you go to the website, and the slides will have the link, you know, there's a paper called Breaking Up is Hard to Do, and there's another one about domain zero disaggregation. That will explain in detail all that's, that's needed there. There's a, something called Cubes OS. Has anyone seen, seen Cubes OS? It's an interesting little, little concept which kind of takes disaggregation to its most bizarre ends inside a lot of ways, because it'll create a desktop and where we would normally have each one of these little boxes being maybe a separate program, it's actually each one of these little boxes is a separate domain. It's a separate machine. And yet it's displaying them all on one, one location. Different, weird, but it works, and it works using disaggregation. So I mean, pe people are finding use cases for this beyond what even the Zen team had, uh, had expected. So what are the benefits? Security. You know, I mean, if all you have to attack is just a network driver in a box, you're not going to get, you're not going to hack it and end up in a shell script. There's nothing there. It's just a network drive. Worst they can do is make it fall over, and we can make it fail over in, you know, a quarter of a second. Uh, serviceability and flexibility, likewise. We can split things out and manage them better. Better robustness. You know, if uh, you know, any time that you're using a a uh, a machine to uh, to service the hypervisor, whether you're using Type Two or Type One hypervisor, if that machine falls over, you got to get that machine back up. Well, you know, if if a disaggregated driver falls over, like I said, fraction of a second back up. You know, it's, it's uh, tremendous for that. Better performance, once again, if you have all these various things talking to one, and you got a lot of them, could be a performance bottleneck, depending on what your, uh, what your guests are doing. But if you can break them up into pieces and have different ones talking to different ones, suddenly there's no bottleneck. It's up to you. By default, you get the simple case, where it all goes through the control domain. But if that doesn't work, you know, if, if, it, if there's a performance thing, break them out. That's what you want to do. You have the capability, you have the control. So you've got the better performance, better scalability likewise. You know, if you've got lots of things hitting, then start breaking them up into pieces. You can scale outward. The uh, architecture diagram before and after. Okay, let's get that. See, now this is, this is a, what domain zero can look like normally. 
you've got a whole bunch of these things here. You know, you've got the SCSI drivers, you've got the network drivers, you have QMU, which provides other device models for other things other than, you know, network and so forth. You've got the Zappy layer here. Then it's talking across here to the, to the next domain and so forth. And so you've got these things, they're all mounted together and uh, they're all part of one sort of monolithic thing. And that's the way we normally do any sort of, I mean, a, this is basically a map of a normal Linux system. With disaggregation, you can have it look like this. So you have a separate domain for just network, separate domain just for disk I.O., separate domain for anything else that QMU has to provide for you, separate domain for Zappy. And you can have a logging domain and all these other things. So it allows you to break it up into logical pieces because of security, robustness, performance. Here's some of the list of security uh, uh, features. I think I've covered some of them. The big thing to note here is uh, Flask, security modules. Flask is the equivalent of SE Linux. Um, the KVM folks make, make mention of the fact, yeah, we well, can use SE Linux, great. Flask gives us the same thing, and it was also created by the NSA. The NSA, as you, as you probably know by now, very, <laughs> very big on security. So, I mean, the fact that they designed this thing is quite, quite significant. They designed SE Linux as well. So it's compatible with SE Linux. It works extremely well uh, with it. I can't give you a good answer. <laughs> I will find out for you. Um, because like I said, I'm just getting used to this stuff myself. But the, uh, my understanding is that it, it's virtually identical as far as setting it up, but it's using a, a, this a slightly different methodology. Where it, where it shows the difference, let me just pick, go to the next picture. Look at this. So if you can see this red section. This network driver has been Flask enabled. So it's been totally segmented, so you can't get out. You can't do anything other than network I.O. Through that, through that driver domain. So it, it allows you a higher degree of, higher granularity of, uh, of traffic management and so forth. You can really fence in one of these driver domains so that, um, uh, so that you, you just can't break it. You know, I mean, the worst you can do is knock it over. But if you knock it over, we can restart it again in a fraction of a second. Um, and you know, I, I'm, I, I can try to get you a reference for Flask configuration, but I think that's a level of granularity that the standard SE Linux isn't going to play with too much, but it makes sense here. So I'll, I'll have to get you more information. If you uh, stick with me afterwards, let me get your information, and I'll, and I'll try to get you something uh, to answer that directly. Then there's the ARM hypervisor. Let's see, so we've got just a couple of minutes. This is actually really cool. Um, we are fully functional for ARM 7 and 8. Well, ARM, ARM 8 isn't in uh, silicon yet, but we have the emulator that's issued. And uh, it works, and it works well. So here are some of the ARM v7s that we know work with Zen and then we can use the fast model. Now, this is just a general ARM uh, diagram, gen general DARM, ARM architecture. So this is with virtualization, that's why you need V7 and V8 of ARM, because prior to that, you don't have its virtualization extensions. And I'll tell you, when, uh, when one of the guys who was working on this started to describe this to me, you could see the excitement because he said, you know, this is, this is hand and glove. This thing is hand and glove. It's like it was designed for us. And here's, here's the picture. So this is what you have. You've got a user mode, you've got a kernel mode, you've got the hypervisor mode as, des as designed by ARM, and then you've got, you know, the various pieces of, of uh, other hardware that it has to talk to in the ARM world. Well, Zen hypervisor 
neatly falls into the hypervisor mode and the MMU and the GT and all that sort of stuff just fits right in. Next, the guest VMs, and that includes the control VM, DOM0, fit immediately into the user and kernel space. It just fits. It's just right. So what does that leave us with? I.O. Well, there you go. The control domain handles the I.O. just like it would normally do it. And this is PV, so it's, it's got the API there. Since we don't have to worry in the ARM world about legacy operating systems like Windows, we can just make sure that the PV interface, that, that API interface, is there. It's not a problem. There's nothing that we have to worry about that's old that, uh, that has to be accommodated. So you've got this thing here that just fits. And whereas, as I said, these were the two modes that I said in a few years on the x86 world were going to be the default, the, the sort of the optimized HVM and the optimized PV mode. For ARM, you only need one mode because it just works. It's just perfect the way it is. And it is fully optimized, you know, one mode to rule them all, the great ring, you know. So it is fully optimized. We don't have to go anywhere. It just fits. Look at the lines of code. The x86 hypervisor, you're talking about 100, 120 lines of code, 120,000 lines of code. If you work on it in the mobile devices which don't have the virtual extensions, 60 lines of code, 60K lines of code. You get it for ARM v7 and beyond, 17,000 lines of code. It's tight. It fits. It's glorious. That's why this guy was having just, just, just almost having seizures talking about it to me, you know, because it's just, it's beautiful. It just fits marvelously. One interesting thing about this effort is after they went through and they, and they put together all this ARM code, they start going back and they said, you know, we can optimize some of this. So actually the number of lines of code in the x86 size began to shrink because they began to learn so many things about doing it well here that they could shrink down some of the old crufty stuff out of the x86 stuff. So that was sort of a side benefit of all this arm work. But the, the net, when you go from 100, 120,000 down to 17,000 lines of code, it's glorious. Now let's just talk for a second about Mirage OS. We're running uh, close to the end here. It's a library operating system. If you go to zenproject.org, you, you can see more about Mirage OS. Um, if you were in the session before this, uh, the gentleman was talking about program and Haskell. Um, these are just these teeny tiny things that are written in Erlang, in Haskell, in OCaml that have very small footprint, very low latency, and you can make lots of them. So they become very dedicated little library concepts that you throw something in, you get something out. That's it. It's a very strange little thing, but it gives you this sort of uh, uh, intense, fast, quick, uh, possibilities. And just, uh, I would just say, I'm going to default to the website for, for greater details on what you can do with this stuff. But they're, they're running some very interesting things this way. And you can, of course, migrate these things in nothing flat because they're teeny tiny. <laughs> you know, they're gone. It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting little project uh, that could enable a lot of things down the road. So it's part of the Zen Project in Incubator. First release is coming, it's in beta now, and uh, it's talking about certain of the protocols. You know, you could have a, just a, a, uh, a special purpose web server. You could have you know, SSH and DNS and all these things. So it, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing here, and in fact, uh, when you get the slides, there's a whole thing just on what you can do with Mirage. So I'll have to leave that. With you. So what's next? Zen 4.3. Before the month is out, we expect Zen 4.3 to be here. Uh, our last, uh, what we're hoping is our last test day is this Wednesday. You want to take a look at it? You want to goof around with it? Wednesday is test day. You can actually uh, download Release Candidate 4. 
Um, if you look up uh, Zen testing on, uh, and it, it's here on the roadmap, but if you look up Zen testing on the wiki, it'll give you instructions on how to get the code and how to test the code. And then you can file a test report. So if you want to take a look and you want to see whether it works for you, go right ahead. So there's a bunch of stuff here. You've got, you've got all the Zen ARM stuff for servers coming in. We're still working on, on the mobile device stuff. You know, you've got uh, extended uh, security modules, uh, updates to libvirt to make libvirt more powerful for us, and then things, one of the big ones down here is uh, performance and NUMA support uh, for those who are into NUMA. Um, and, you know, that becomes real important with some of the, some of the new hardware that's coming out, and uh, more recent hardware, uh, particularly in the ARM space, but also elsewhere. But the NUMA support is supposed to be much, much nicer. Um, so if you want to take a look at that sort of stuff, you, it's, it's out there now, and you know, join us on Wednesday. And what's coming? Um, a shared test infrastructure. This came, as part, came about as part of the Linux Foundation move. Right now, you've got you know, various companies and organizations that are trying to work with the Zen hypervisor, and they each had their own test clouds, basically, to work with. There's no need for that. So we are we're working with our backers and uh, we're trying to put together a common, uh, a common uh, test area so you can share the test infrastructure if you want to be able to test stuff. Um, better uh, distribution in integration, the big one, of course, is this CentOS-based uh, project that's coming out uh, real soon now. Uh, more on the downstreams, you know, better, better integration with OpenStack, better integration here with this Zen Orchestra thing that's coming along, which is really interesting. Um, uh, more stuff with the, uh, you know, with the toolkits. Um, and then just a quickie here, if you want to get and start, you want to assist at all in the life of the Zen project, we have document days monthly. If you, if you see things, you know, we, we do a lot with that wiki particularly. Tons of information on the wiki. If you find that things, you know, it's like, well, it's, it's kind of missing this information or it could be better here. Join us. It's normally the last Monday of the month. Uh, go to the wiki. It'll tell you how, how to join us. You can edit the wiki and make changes and improve things. Uh, you know, it's cool. Prior to release, we have the test days. Like I said, RC4 is, is on Wednesday, um, and there's plenty of instructions there on the wiki as well. We also, of course, if you go to zenproject.org, you can see all the mailing lists, IRC, both of which are extremely well used in this project. And please, take a look at zenproject.org. One of the things about this, if you've ever been to zen.org, the original website, it looked like it was 10 years old. It was focused on developers. So if you're a user, you go there, and it's like, where is anything? I, I don't quite. We're trying to make Zen Project more usable for users. You got something you want? You want we want you to be able to find the pointer to it here. So if you go to Zen Project and you're not finding what you need, tell us. Send me an email. Use the contact form on the website. Whatever. Let us know because that was the first thing that I had to focus on, first three months that I was in this job. So we had to get this thing put together. And if it's not doing the job or if it needs improvement, tell me so we can get it done. Because we want this to be ultra useful for you folks. And also annually, we have things like the Zen Hackathon, the Developer Summit. There's also a User Summit coming. Those are normally come annually. If you go to Zen Project, you'll find announcements for all of them as they come up. And then here are some basic links. Uh, we've got our blog, which is actually pretty active at this point. Uh, I think we're getting about two or three blogs a week uh, out. We've got uh, the zenproject.org which has the references to just about everything in the universe. The wiki, which is just massive amounts of, uh, of detailed information um, and very, uh, very useful. And then we've got a whole library of presentations and videos, most of which you can get from zenproject.org, but we've got the straight URLs here. So there's my Twitter, there's my Skype, emails on the front. And we just ran out of time, but as there's nothing else happening, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you might have.
<laughs> Thank you. So thank you very much for coming, and especially I know this is, you know, Dead Men's Hour, last time, time frame on Sunday, you could actually like be going home and seeing people you love and maybe having something good to eat, but I thank you for coming. Plant stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the, uh, you know, of the community and, and the speed at which these, uh, these, you know, these, these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens. Uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others. 
like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. 
I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astra Space Systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.